Welcome, brothers and sisters. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come into your living room and share with you God's word. As you know, we have been producing a series called Decision Time. There is now seven discs in this series. When we started out, we had planned to make five discs. But as time went on, the information continued to come to us, and we decided we needed to add more. We went up to seven discs. And now we are ready to make even the eighth disc. And so what we have decided to do, rather than make an eighth disc in this series, we are actually going to make a decision time series two. Because there's just a lot of information that we need to share with you saints. And we don't want to rush through this and just try to compact it into uh, uh, just eight discs or nine discs. We feel at this point in time that we probably need to add another seven discs to the series. So... You have been viewing Decision Time 1. We are now in the process of making Decision Time 2. And this is the first disc in Decision Time 2. Now let me bring you up to, let me just kind of bring you up to speed some of the things that we've been doing. You know that we have been sending out this little booklet called The Closing Probation for Seven-Day Adventists. And with this little booklet, we have been sending out uh, the first disc, the introductory disc to the Decision Time Series number one. At this point in time, we have sent out 75,000 of these little booklets, 75,000 of this disc, and 75,000 of the letter that went with all of this. And the response has been tremendous. And I don't want to say that the response has been all good because there's been some negative response as well as good response. The good response has outweighed the negative response by a long shot, but it's amazing some of the responses that we're getting from people that receive this information. This is Bible, spirit of prophecy information that we're sending out because it's the end time, saints. And some people write us back, call us, email us, and what have you, and say, take us off of your mail list. Don't ever send us anything else. And even go so far as to say they don't even believe in LNG White. And these are seven-day events. So it is quite amazing uh, some of the responses that we're getting. Now, it kind of goes along with the title of this first disc in Decision Time 2, because the very the title in this first disc of Decision Time 2 is the Alpha and Omega Apostasy. In this first disc, we're actually going to be dealing with the Alpha. But before we do that, I want to, I want to refresh your memory. Before we have prayer, I want to refresh your memory of some of the things we talked about in the introductory DV, as well as the Decision Time series in its totality. Now, you remember in the introductory DVD, we talked about the generations that as we, as we go through time, the generations from first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, etc. So we're going to touch on some of these things in this first DVD in this decision time too. But before we do this, we want to seek the Lord in prayer as his blessings upon what we're about to do. And I just want to tell you, saints, we are in some very serious times. There's so much information that I want to share with you, and I hope that we have the opportunity to share it in this second, uh, this second series. As you look at the economy, you know for 20 years, based on the word of God, the Bible, and the spirit of prophecy, I've talked about the fall of the economy as a prerequisite to the passing of the National Sunday Law. We are now in the worst economic times that this world has ever experienced. It is a worldwide crisis, but it's right here in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that this crisis was coming. And so we are living in some very, very serious times, very critical times, times in which, brothers and sisters, you and I need to learn to pray and pray effectively so that God can give us answers. So even now, as we prepare to have prayer, I want you to pray with us. Pray and ask God's direction as I make this, make, prepare this information that we're about to send out. And pray that God will give you the strength to become a part of his team that he will use to finish his work. Let us pray at this time. Father in heaven, in the name of thy son Jesus Christ, we come again before thy righteous and holy throne. Lord, as we prepare to share this information, we recognize, Lord, that it will not reach any hearts. It will not touch anyone. No changes will be made unless, Lord, it is accompanied 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, in our feeble efforts to share this information, we ask for the blessings, we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all thou hast done for us and all that you will do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we look at the screen, we see our slide, the Alpha and the Omega Apostasy. And as I said earlier, in this first disc in this second series of Decision Time 2, we're going to deal with the Alpha more so than the Omega. In the second disc, we'll be dealing more with the Omega. But before we do any of this, I want to go back, as I said before the prayer, I want to go back and just refresh your memory on some of the things that we've already talked about. First thing I want to do is show you the last uh, slide that was in Decision Time 1, uh, the last slide in the seventh disc. That slide was a symbol that this flag, rather, and this logo was a symbol that the king of the north has in it the glorious land. We went through Daniel 11 chapter and we got down to verse 40 and verse 41 it says and that the king of the north entered the glorious land and we had showed you that the glorious land is the seventh day Adventist church. Now I don't want you to forget this because we are actually coming back to build on this in this series because we hadn't we have not exhausted all the information that we need to share with you about this. So I want to just Want you, I want you to put this on the desktop. The last slide in that series was that this new logo that we adopted in 1995 was a symbol that the king of the north has entered the glorious land. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to show you this and prove it to you without a doubt in this series. And it probably, we'll probably do this by the second disc in this series. We are certainly in a crisis time, and it really is decision time, but it is decision time individually for you and I. You and I have to decide if we're going to do what God says do, if we're going to do what man says do. And Peter says it is better to obey God than to, than to obey man. Let's go to our Bibles right now. Let's go to Revelation, the 12th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 17. And this is a familiar text for us the Seventh-day Adventists. Revelation 12, 17, the Bible says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you and I need to recognize that we are in a warfare. We're in a warfare, brothers and sisters, for our very lives, our spiritual lives, our eternal life. We are in a warfare. And Satan is very subtle, as you're going to see. Satan is very subtle in his attacks upon God's church. I believe this is God's church. I believe there's still a work to be done in him. We're going to really elaborate on this as we, as we continue. We've talked about this to some degree already, but we're going to really elaborate. We want, you and I need to see what, what we need to be doing right now. Right now, we need to know what we need to be doing. Satan is going to make war with the remnant of the sea, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show you another slide that was in the introductory DVD, the How Soon is Soon. I want to show you another slide because I have not forgot the goal of where we're trying to take you. So let's look at another slide now. In this slide, we talked about the five generations, the five generations. I want to go through this just a little bit. So that we can kind of reiterate and rebuild this foundation that we're, we're, so we can see where we're going. Down at the bottom of the screen, you see that Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of his power that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. What the prophet is saying here that Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of his power. And we're going to explore this message in detail. What is this message that Satan is seeking to gradually to, to water down? Looking at the screen, we see that God brought us on the scene in 1844. Over to your left, 1844 until 1884 would be a first generation if we use 40 years 
as a generation. And, and in the Bible, 40, 40 years is applied to a generation for the first, when, we, when God first starts talking about a generation, he uses 40 years to, to give us a, a barometer. So let's use this 40 years. So from 1844 to 1884 would be the first generation of Seventh-day Adventists. And you remember, in the introductory DVD, we talked about how God established this church during that first generation. The pillars were laid down uh, during this first generation. And so we, from 1884, we move on to the second generation. 1884 to 1924 would be the second generation of Seventh-day Adventists. And then we move to the third generation, which would be 1924 to 1964. Understand, saints. And then the fourth generation would be 1964 to 2004. And the fifth generation would be 2004 to 2044. Now, right now, the fifth generation of Seventh-day Adventists are being born into the church. They started to be born in 2004. They're still kids at this time. This is 2009, so the oldest Adventist in the fifth generation right now is uh, 2004 would be five years old. At think for a minute. Now let's look at our screen. And when the second generation was born, began to be born into the church, they did not become movers and shakers in the church till they were at least 20 years old. In other words, when the, when the second generation is began to be born into the church, they're just babes. So they're just being born into a, uh, to a situation that's already there. And so they come up through the ranks and they be, believe what they're being taught and what have you, etc. So they don't become the movers and shakers until they're about 20 years old. By the time a kid is 20 years old, he's now, he's graduated from school. He's probably maybe going to college. If he hadn't go to college, he's become moving up into the church, but maybe to begin, to, to begin holding offices and what have you. So they become movers and shakers about at the age of 20 years old. And then they begin to set standards and change things and what have you at about 20 years old. You understand what I'm saying here now? Let's continue. So if we look at our screen, the second generation being born into the church in 1884 didn't become movers and shakers until about 20 years later. Now, so from 1884 to 1924, we have the second generation. Moving on. 1924, the third generation is born into the church, and for the first 20 years of their life, they are more or less under the tutelage of the previous generation. But then they become the movers and shakers in the church and what have you. They begin to to go off to school and what have you, come back with degrees and what have you, unfortunate with degrees, and, and they get married and what have you, and they move up in the church and they become officers in the church, and then that generation have changed things a, a, a little bit as well. And remember, Elder G. White says, Satan is seeking gradually to rob this message of his power, and he has systematically done this over a period of time. Let's continue. 1964 to 2004 would bring us to our fourth generation, and the, and the same process would ensue. For the first 20 years of their life in the church, they would just be under the tutelage of the previous generation. But then they would move into the ranks and also begin to change things and what have you. And then we would move to the fifth generation, which would be 2004. And right now, those kids that were being born into this church right now are just, as I said before, they're just babes. They won't become the movers and shakers until 20 years later. So we are looking at, uh, let me just go back. The, the, the second generation began to, began to be movers and shakers around 1904. The second generation began to be movers and shakers around 1944. The third generation began to be movers and shakers around 1984. And the fourth, fifth generation would not become movers and shakers around 2024. In other words, by 2024, the fifth generation of seven day Adventists will be moving into the ranks to become the decision makers of the church. Now, if you remember, I said in the introductory DVD of How Soon is Soon that if God did not come before this fifth generation moved into the, the, the power positions of the church, that the church as we know it, Adventism as we know it, would be extinct. Because all of the pillars that God gave us under the first generation has been destroyed by the fourth generation. And so if the fifth generation may, would move into the position of being church leaders and what have you, there would be nothing left 
of the Adventism that God gave us in the first generation. Do you understand what I'm saying, saints? Now, I just want to reiterate that to you. I, brothers and sisters, it is decision time. And I'll tell you, we need to be students of the word. We need to understand what God is trying to say to us. Now, look at this chart good. Now, we're not going to really deal any more with this in this particular uh, disc. But I want, to I want you to remember what, I, what we started off with, what we began to, what we wanted to show, to show you that it is decision time, saints. Let's continue. It is decision time. It is decision time, 2009. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy. And I want to give you a, it's a very, another very familiar text. 2 Timothy chapter 2, looking at verses 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15. Then we want to see what the prophet has to say about this. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 2, verses 15. The Bible says, Steady to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Brothers and sisters, God is requiring you and I to study. He is... He is requiring us, brothers and sisters, to search the word of God. He is he's requiring us to understand the word of God. And during these next, during this series here, this second series, we are going to study like we've never studied before. And I'm asking you to get your King James Bible. Do not get your NIV. Get your King James Bible, brothers and sisters. And we're going to dig into the word of God like we've never dug into it before. The Alpha and Omega Apostasy. Now, normally, when we hear that word, we, the first thing we think about is pantheism. Because we have been taught or we believe that pantheism was the alpha of apostasy. Now, I'm going to show you during this DVD that pantheism is not the alpha of apostasy, but that pantheism was the vehicle that Satan used to attack the pillars and standards of the church back in 1901, 1902, 3, and, and 1904. Pantheism is not the Alpha of Apostasy. Pantheism is the vehicle that Satan used to attack us, to attack us with. Look so what the prophet says. All genuine experience in religious doctrines will bear the impress of Jehovah. All should see the necessity of understanding the truth for themselves individually. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, even as you listen and look at these DVDs, don't take my word for it. Go to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy yourself. I tell people now, don't go and tell anyone that Moses Mason said anything. Unless you can go and say, thus said the word of God, then you don't need to say it. Because you don't need to base your faith on what I say. You need to base your faith on what the word of God says. So I encourage you, let's study the word of God. The prophet continues, all should see the necessity of understanding the truth for themselves individually. We must understand the doctrines that have been studied out carefully and prayerfully. It has been revealed to me that there is among our people a great lack of knowledge in regard to the rise and progress of the third angel's message. There is great need to search the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and learn the text thoroughly that we may know what is written. Saints, I encourage you. I encourage you. Study like you have never studied before. Pray like you have never prayed before. Saints, we are at the end of time. I believe it was all my spirit that we're here. And I believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy both tells us that we're here. Let us continue. The light given me has been very forceful that many would go out from us giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. This woman was a prophet. The Lord desires that every soul who claims to believe the truth shall have an intelligent knowledge of what is truth. You know, saints, when I was brought into this church, there was an old cliche that you're in the truth. And I just assume that I, I, the Sabbath was the truth. Well, brothers and sisters, there are 495 different organizations that keep the Sabbath. Now, as important as the Sabbath is, 
the Sabbath is a part of the truth, but it's not all the truth. Now, it definitely is, will, will be used by Satan as a test, but the Sabbath is not the truth in and of itself, saints. We need to know what is the truth, and Satan is attacking the truth. False prophets will arise and will deceive many. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. Then does it not become everyone to understand the reasons for our faith? We need to understand why we are Seventh-day Adventists. We need to understand this. And it's not just because we go to church on Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It's deeper than that. It's much deeper than that. Let us continue. In place of having so many sermons, there should be a more close searching of the word of God. Opening the scriptures, text by text, and searching for the strong evidences that sustain the fundamental doctrines that have brought us where we now are upon the platform of eternal truth. Brothers and sisters, we need to search the scriptures. We need to understand who we are and why we are who we say we are. What brought us into existence as a people? We need to understand these things. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you again, it is decision time. Continue. The Alpha and the Omega Apostasy, taken from Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 193 to 208. And this was written from 1895 to 1904. This, I mean, 1895 to 1904, this is when this, this alpha began to move in. Satan be, uh, began to do things to try to shake up the saints. Let's look at our first, first statement here. We know that the alpha was brought to us by none other than Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. This is a name that's most associated with the alpha of apostasy. And, and again, with that alpha apostle, we always attach pantheism to it. Now, brother, Dr. Kellogg did indeed teach pantheism. But pantheism, again, was just a vehicle that Satan used through Dr. Kellogg in order to attack the truth that God has given us as a people. Let's read this statement. Now, this is very important, brothers and sisters. We want to study this statement. By the way, Ellen G. White was a prophet, saints. There's no questions about it. It's a, like I, I said before, it is amazing how many letters, phone calls, and emails that we're getting from people that we've sent out this information to that denounce Ellen G. White as a prophet. Say so she's not a prophet. We don't need her. These are Seventh-day Adventists. How did they get into the church and not believing in Ellen G. White? How can you be a Seventh-day Adventist and not believe in Ellen G. White? And you know that the, the prophet says the last deception of Satan would be to make a none effect the testimonies of the Spirit of God. She says there would be a hatred killing against the testimonies which is satanic. I'll be honest with you. I have been blown away by some of the remarks that I have received, or uh, some of the calls and letters and what have you that I received from Seventh-day Adventists that are sitting in our churches every Sabbath. I have been absolutely blown away. Look what the prophet says. The letter is to our leading physician. Saints, this is so serious. Washington, D.C., July 24, 1904. Dear fellow workers, it's, we're going to do a lot of reading in this DVD, by the way, because we're steady. I am awakened at 11 o'clock. The representations passing before me are so vivid that I cannot sleep. The word of the Lord has come to me that there is a decided work to be done in warning our medical missionaries against the dangers and pearls that surround them. I want to emphasize here that the prophet is saying she singles out medical missionaries at this time. So we see that the alpha of apostasy came, was in a, came through the medical missionary side. And we, we're going to elaborate on that a little bit more as we go. But you see that she, the letter is directed to the medical missionaries. Continue on now. The Lord calls upon those connected with our sanitariums to reach a higher standard. The prophet says, no lie is of the truth. You know, saints, as I have studied the spirit of prophecy now, I have discovered that I have to study the spirit of prophecy just like I do the Bible. You know, Jesus says we should live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And in, and in, and in 
re studying that and reading it, I, be I began to study the Bible differently. I began to read it word for word. And, and as I read it word for word, it opened up so much more information to me. And I've learned now to read the spirit of prophecy word for word. You know, in Testimonies, Volume 6, uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, rather, page 671, she says, my work bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. She says, there's no halfway work in the matter. She says, my work is of the spirit of God or of the spirit of Satan. And brothers and sisters, I would have a hard time believing that Satan had anything to do with writing the Desire of Ages or writing the Great Controversy. So as we read the writings, as we read the information that God has left to us, graciously left to us through the spirit of prophecy, I began to read it word for word. Now let's look at this again. The Lord calls upon those connected with our sanitariums to reach a higher standard. No lie is of the truth. If we follow cunningly devised fables, we unite with the enemy's forces against God and Christ. God calls upon those who have been wearing a yoke of human manufacturing to break this yoke and no longer be the bond servants of men. What the prophet is simply saying here, saints, is that the medical missionaries were under the yoke of bondage of Dr. Kellogg. And he, were, he was feeding them information and they were following him rather than the word of God and the counsel that God had given to him. Saints, it's amazing that today we find our people in the same circumstances. Let's continue. Now look at this next statement, saints. This is very key. This is very key. Look what she says. The battle is on. The battle is on. Satan and his angels are working with all the seeverness of unrighteousness. They are, they are untiring in their efforts to draw souls away from the truth. There's that word again, the truth. What is this truth that Satan is untiring in his efforts to draw souls away from? What is this truth? Is it the Sabbath? I think it's more than the Sabbath things. Away from the truth, away from righteousness to spread run throughout the universe. They work with marvelous industry to furnish a multitude of deceptions to take souls captive. Their efforts are unceasing. The enemy is ever seeking to lead souls into infidelity and skepticism. He would do away with God and with Christ who was made flesh. Did you get that, brothers and sisters? Wait a minute. Let me read this again. Let's look at it again. The enemy is ever seeking to lead souls into infidelity and skepticism. He would do away with God and with Christ who was made flesh. I want you to get that point. She emphasized that who was made flesh and dwelt among us to teach us that in obedience to God's will, we may be victorious over sin. She says, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us to teach us that in obedience to God's will, we may be victorious over sin. Now, did you get that, saints? Let me just, just reiterate he would do a wave of God and with Christ who was made flesh and dwelt among us to teach us that in obedience to God's will, we may be victorious over sin. Now, remember early on, she says, the battle is on. The battle is on. What is the battle about? The battle is about that in obedience to God's will, we may be victorious over sin sin. The battle is on. What is the battle about? That we may become victorious over sin. Let's go back to our Bibles now. Let's go back to Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17, saints. Verse 17. And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed 
which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, Satan's lie from the very beginning was that we could not keep God's law. That the angels didn't need a law. So you can, when he comes to the earth, his, his fight is against those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ being the gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. So Satan, the battle is on to put down all those that believe in the, in the law of God, to want to have this victory, and he trying to, he's trying to destroy every avenue uh, information that will help people to understand this very important, this very important point. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue on. Victory over sin. That's what the battle is over. It's over victory over sin. We're going to we're going to reiterate this point several times since. The everlasting gospel into all the world. Ellen G. White tells us in Testimonies, Volume Seven, Page One Thirty Eight. She says that God has chosen Seventh-day Adventists as his ambassadors. She says that the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals have been given to Seventh-day Adventists. She says to be given to Seventh-day Adventists and, 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 and to be given to the world. And she says in the accomplishments of this work, our publishing houses is among the most effective agencies. We're all familiar with the, with the three angels. But let's just go there for a moment. Let's go to Revelation now, 14. And let's look at Six and seven. Let's see what they have to say, brothers and sisters. We read it many times, but let's read it again. Revelation 14, verses six. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. And I want to highlight that word, the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The Bible is saying here, whatever this everlasting gospel, it must go to all the world, to every nation, every kindred, every tongue and people. Verse 7, sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. That's the first angel's message. Going back to our screen. The first angel's message has something to do with the health work, brothers and sisters. And we'll talk a little bit later because this is something that's so key. We're going to talk a little bit more about this health work in, in relationship to this truth that God has given us. So, but the first angel's message has something to do with the health work. Look what the prophet says about this now. She says, the indifference with which the help books have been treated by many is an offense to God. To separate, separate, to separate the help work from the great body of the work is not in his order. Now we need to read that again. I want to make sure you understand what we're reading here. We are studying the word of God. To separate the help work from the great body of the work is not in his order. Present truth lies in the work of health reform, as verily as in other features of gospel work. No one branch, when separated from the other, can be a perfect whole. Let me explain. Now, you know, she says that the health work is the right arm of the message. Here's my right arm. So if you take the right arm and tie it behind the back, you only got one arm. But she says that the help work is the right arm of the message. So Satan has sought first to bind the right arm of the message. Now watch him. Watch him now, saints. I want you to follow this. I want you to follow this. We're studying the word of God. We're going to collaborate this Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. We are talking about the Alpha and Omega Apostle, but in this first disc, in this decision time two, we are going to zero in on the Alpha because, see, we need to understand the Alpha in order to understand the Omega. We need to understand the Alpha, so let's make sure we understand and get this thing right. Let's continue. Here is the miracle. That's the help work on our left. 
and the theology on our right. And she says those two must go together. Let me, matter of fact, let me back it up. Let me back it up again. To separate the health work from the great body of the work is not in his order. So the health work, the medical work, and the theology or doctrinal or what have you must go together to make a whole. In other words, the three angels' message consists of both. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? All right, let's continue. So let me, let's go forward. On our left, we have the medical work. On our right, we have the theology or the doctrine or whatever, you, whatever we want to call it. So she says they must go together. But Satan, working through Harvard Kellogg, separated the medical from the theology. So when he separated the medical from theology, he put one arm behind our back. He tied it off. Now watch what's going to happen, brothers and sisters. Watch this now. This is serious. The Alpha of Apostles. We know the story that John Harvey Kellogg wrote a book called The Living Temple. Look what the prophet says about this book. We won't get into the, all what's in the book. We're just going to see what the prophet says. She says, I have been instructed by the heavenly messenger that some of the reasoning in the book Living Temple is unsound. Now, that's the key here. The prophet didn't say everything in that was unsound. She says, some of the things, some of the reasoning in the book, Living Temple, is unsound. Some. You see, Satan is very subtle. He gives you some truth. At the, at, in the Garden of Eden, didn't he tell Eve some truth? But there was a lie there as well, a detrimental lie. I have been instructed by the heavenly mission that some of the reasoning in the book, Living Temple, is unsound. And that this reasoning would lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of present truth. You know, Peter, let's go to Peter right quick. Let's go to Second Peter. In Second Peter, chapter 1, Second Peter, chapter 1. As Peter goes through the staff steps, starting with verses 3 down to verses 14. I want to get down to verses 12. I, we, later on, we'll later on we would, we would actually talk about all this here, but let's get down to verse 12. The Bible says here, as Peter says, as he gets through here with his dialogue, in verse 12 he says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present Truth. That's Second Peter chapter one, verses twelve. God wants you and I to be established in the present truth. Continue on. She says, "I look at the saints. All through the book are passages of Scripture. These Scriptures are brought in such a way that error is made to appear as truth. So in this book, Living Temple, that was Scriptures throughout the, throughout the book." But the scriptures was brought in in such a way that error was made to appear as true. Now, remember, this is the alpha of apostasy. So re remember, we are also establishing a principle and a foundation so that when we get to the omega, we will be able to see what Satan is doing in the omega. So here was a book that was written. And it's in this book. That error was made to appear as truth. And people embraced this back then. And Ellen G. God had to step in through, through Ellen G. White and show the people the errors. Look at this thing. She says, erroneous theories are presented in so pleasing a way that unless care is taken, many will be misled. I want you to get this, saints. Error, erroneous theories are presented in so pleasing a way that unless care is taken, many will be misled. Continue. Now, what we're going to do here, we're going to go through Selected Messages, Book 1, and we now are going to show you what was taking place, what was, it, what was attacked during this period of time in the Alpha of Apostasy. Again, I want to say that pantheism is not the alpha of apostasy, 
but it is the vehicle that Satan used to bring about this alpha of apostasy. Remember, the alpha of apostasy is an attack on the truth. Now watch what the prophet says. And you watch this now. Physicians, have you been doing the master's business in listening to fanciful and spiritualistic interpretations of the scriptures? Interpretations which undermine the foundations of our faith. So she's saying here that these spiritualistic interpretations undermine the foundations of our faith. And you look, look over to your right now, and I've put it over here in yellow, that she's saying it undermined the foundation of our faith. And holding your peace, God says, neither will I be with you anymore unless you awake and vindicate your Redeemer. So the prophet is saying that this, this, this alpha of a posse came in in a way to undermine the foundations of our faith. And so I've highlighted it over on the right-hand side of the screen. Let's look at the next statement. We're going to look at five statements from, this, from, this, from the spirit of prophecy on this. And each one will be highlighted on the right. A perversion of truth. I told you there would be a lot of reading. We need to study saints. Text by text, statement by statement, etc. My message to you is no longer consent to listen without protest to the perversions of truth. Brothers and sisters, this is a principle. We can no longer consent to listen to the perversions of truth. If you do, you're taking a neutral position. And if there's any sin that God hates more than anything, it is neutrality in a time of crisis. Look what she says. Unmask the pretentious to history, which, if received, will lead ministers and physicians and medical missionary workers to ignore the truth. Thanks, we're going someplace. I'm going to tell you it's decision time. Everyone is now to stand on his guard. God calls upon men and women to take their stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. I have been instructed to warn our people for many are in danger of receiving theories and sophistries that undermine the foundation pillars of the faith. Again, on the right, I've highlighted undermine the foundation pillars of the faith. Let's look at the next statement. As a people, we are to stand firm on the platform of eternal truth that has withstood test and trial. Now, all of this was written during the Alpha of Omega. You read this in, in the first selected message, book one, first selected message. We are, taught, we are to hold the sure pillars of our faith. Again, the prophetess is emphasizing that we need to hold the sure pillars of our faith because in the alpha, there was an attack upon the pillars of our faith. That's what it was. It was an attack upon the truth, upon the pillars of our faith, saints. Pantheism was simply the vehicle that Satan used to attack the pillars of our faith. The principles, the principles of truth that God has revealed to us are our only true foundation. They have made us what we are. The lapse of time have not lessened their value. It is the constant effort of the enemy to remove these truths from their setting and to put in their place spurious theories. He will bring in everything that he possibly can to carry out his deceptive designs. But the Lord will raise up men of keen perception who will give these truths their proper place in the plan of God. And God is looking for men and women who will stand up and take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth in spite of, in spite of whatever. Continue on. I have been instructed by the heavenly messenger that some of the reasoning in the book Living Temple is unsound and that this reason will lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of our faith. Again, on the right, I put in pillars of our faith, true foundation and foundation principles. This, again, we're dealing with the alpha of apostasy, a view of approaching danger. About the time that Living Temple was published, there passed before me in the night season representations indicating that some danger was approaching and that I must prepare for it by writing out the things God had revealed to me regarding the foundation principles of our faith. A copy of Living Temple was sent me, but it remained in my library unread from the unread. From the light given me by the Lord, I knew that some of the sentiments advocated in the book did not bear the endorsements of God. Again, she said some of the sentiments. See, Satan is very slick, very subtle. 
and that we and, uh, and, and advocated in the book did not bear the endorsements of God and that they were a snare that the enemy had prepared for the last days. Let me read that again, brothers and sisters. Let me read that again. In the book that did not bear the endorsement of God and that they were a snare that the enemy had prepared for the last day. I thought that this would surely be discerned. The prophecy, she thought that this would surely be discerned by others in, 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 in position. And that it would not be necessary for me to say anything about it. Ellen G. White didn't want to say anything because, see, Kellogg was like a son to her. She had helped him out in school and Cedric gave him the money, etc. So she didn't, she wanted someone else to do this. But God told her, look at this next statement. In a vision of the night, I was shown distinctly that these sentiments have been looked upon by some as the grand truths people had been to see that are to be brought in and made prominent at the present time. I was shown a platform braced by solid timbers, the truths of the word of God, someone high, someone high in responsibility in the medical work was directing this man and that man to loosen the timbers supporting this platform. Then I heard a voice saying, where are the watchmen? that ought to be standing on the walls of Zion. And I say today, brothers and sisters, where are the watchmen that ought to be standing on the walls of Zion? Where are they? You know, in, tes in, in Testimonies of Ministers, page 411, the prophet says that Satan has built up walls around God's church to prevent the truth from getting in. She says, but God has men of opportunity who will go through those walls of restriction as if they are walls with untempered mortar. And brothers and sisters, I, I plan by the grace of God to be one of those men that will go through those walls of restriction, restrictions as if they are untempered mortar. Continuing on from my, from my screen. She says, are they asleep? This foundation was built by the master worker and will stand storm and tempest. Will they permit this man to present doctrines that deny the past experience of the people of God? The time has come to take the sided action. Again, on my right, this foundation was built by the master worker. Brothers and sisters, the truths that we have as a people were given to us by God. These are special truths, brothers and sisters. Let's continue. Shortly before I sent out the testimonies regarding the efforts of the enemy to undermine the foundation of our faith through the dis dis dissemination of seductive theories, I had read an incident about a ship in a fog meeting an iceberg. For several nights I slept but low. I seemed to be bowed down as a cart beneath sheaves. One night a scene was clearly presented before me. A vessel was upon the waters in a heavy fog. Suddenly the lookout cried. Iceberg just ahead. There, towering high above the ship, was a gigantic iceberg, and a authoritative voice cried out, Meet it! That was not a moment's hesitation. It was a time for instant action. The engineer put on full steam, and the man at the wheel steered the ship straight into the iceberg. With a crash, she struck the ice. Then was a fearful shock, and the iceberg broke into many pieces, falling with noise like thunder to the deck. The passionists were violently shaken by the, force, by the force of the collision, but no lives were lost. The vessel was injured, but not beyond repair. She rebounded from the contact, trembling from stem to stern like a living creature. Then she moved forward on her board. Meet it. It's time to meet it, brothers and sisters. It's decision time. We have some saints. There is some information that, I, that I'm going to share with you that you just will not believe. Meet it. I'm laying a foundation up. Meet it. Ellen G. White was instructed to meet the alpha of apostasy. The alpha of apostasy was brought in through the medical side of the three angels' messages, through the medical part of, our, of, of the gospel. That's how, the, that's how the alpha came in, through the medical, through the physicians, Satan used the medical side to bring the alpha of apostle in, and the, he, he, he attacked the pillars, the foundation of our church, through the, the, 
the miracle uh, through the physicians. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue now. It will be said that the living temple has been revised, but the Lord has shown me that the writer has not changed and that there can be no unity between him and the ministers of the gospel. While he continues to cherish his present sentiments, I am bidden to lift my voice in warning to our people, saying, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. And again, I want to emphasize that we are now looking at the Alpha in order that we may understand the Omega. The Alpha was an attack upon the foundation pillars of this church. And Ellen G. White says the battle is on over victory over sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Continue on. The Omega Apostasy. Living Temple contained the alpha of these theories. I knew that the Omega would follow in a little while, and I trembled for our people. Saints, the prophet says she knew that the Omega would, con would come shortly, and that she trembled for our people. Now, the Omega, the alpha, 1901, 1902, 1903, 1904. But she says, the Omega will come shortly. And she says, I tremble for our people. You know, there's been much debate about this Omega. Many books and what have you been written about this Omega. God is now showing us what the Omega really is. She says the Omega would be of a most startling nature. Get this point, saying The Alpha came through the physicians, the health side of the work. Now, just think. And the, 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 medical, the, the, the medical side of the work was separated from the doctrinal side of the theology side during this alpha apostle. Satan succeeded in separating these two, the, the two. He, he succeeded. And, and they have never come back together again. There's been attempts, but have, really the church has never embraced true medical missionary work ever since then. It's never been embraced. I, I hate to say it, but the work today that we do is not the medical missionary work that God is talking about. But that's another story. Living Temple contains the alpha of these theories. I knew that the Omega would fall in a little while, and I tremble for our people. That's the old ship of Zion, admit it. And I want to be a part of the old ship of Zion. We're talking about individually, brothers and sisters. Now look at this slide. We have the Alpha of Omega. You see an iceberg is small on top, even though it might look big, huge. But the bigger part of an iceberg is under the water. And it's amazing that God gave the symbol of an iceberg to represent the Alpha of Apostle. If you look at this screen, you see the Alpha of Apostle at the top, but then you see the Omega at the bottom, and look how much larger the Omega is. Look, at, look how big the iceberg is underwater as, con as compared to what's on top, and the part on top is huge. We think if you didn't see the part on the bottom, you think, well, this is a huge, but look what's under the water. Now, the Alpha, the Omega would be of a most startling nature. Omega means the end. Alpha is the beginning, but Omega is the end. Now, saints, if the Alpha was an attack upon the pillars of our faith through the physicians of the medical side of the work, what would the Omega be? Who would it come through? Who would the, where would the Omega apostasy come from, and what would it do? It would, it, would, it would be the last effort by Satan to attack the standards, the pillars of our faith. It would be the same thing. It would just be his last effort. The Alpha attacked the pillars and foundation of our church through the physicians. The Omega would do the same thing, brothers and sisters, through the ministerial side of the church. Now, I have put something out there now. I'm going to prove it. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Question. Based on what we have learned about the Alpha of Apostasy, what would Satan lead men to do through the Omega Apostasy? And I've just told you. He would lead men to do the same thing through the Omega that he did through the Alpha. And it would be the foul attack upon the standards, the pillars, that God has given us as a people. And we have already shown you 
that victory over sin is the central thing here. Watch this, brothers and sisters. Watch it. Look at the prophet says. She says, the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Did you get it, brothers and sisters? Look what the prophet says. The enemy of souls, that's Satan. Let's go to, let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Matthew 13, chapter. Matthew, the 13th chapter, saints. Lord, be with us as we study your word. Matthew 13. You've heard me read this before. Saints, it's decision time. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, starting with verses 24, the Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Now, that's a, you know, this is a story in itself. But I just want to get to a point. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath the tares? Verse 28, he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Now, we've talked about this many times before in our presentation, I think. But verse 30 says, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bones to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, as the disciples come and want this thing interpreted. So Jesus now began to interpret. And let's go over and see where he begins to interpret. What does he say? In verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Ellen G. White commenting on this, she says, Has God no living church? She says he has a church, but it is the church militant and not the church triumphant. She goes on and said there are two opposing influences in the church. One is working for the corrupting of the people of God, and the other is working for the purification of the people of God. Two powers, she says. One is of Satan, and one is of God. And they're both in the church. Now, how did these terrorists get in here? Let's see what it says, eh? Verse 39. The enemy that sold them is the devil. War on the church. Satan has brought in tares into God's church. And what God has to do, he has to separate these wheat from the tares in his church. And that's the number that God is going to use to finish his work. But in the meantime, Satan has attacked the pillars of our faith in this last this effort in the Omega to do the same thing that he did in the Alpha. And the, the prophet says here, the enemy of souls have sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven day Adventists. Oh, brothers and sisters, I am just, I, I wish I could run ahead and just give you all this information one time, but we're going to take it step by step. The enemy of souls have sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines that which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. In other words, saints, she said in the alpha, in the omega, that would be an attempt by the devil working through unconsecrated men to change the doctrines of the church. Let's, let's continue. Question, brothers and sisters, question. What are the doctrines that stand as the pillar of our faith. What are they? She says, well, look what she says. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. So what are the doctrines? What are the doctrines that stand as the pillars of our faith and where did they come from? The prophet says, the scripture which above all others had been both the foundation 
and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The scripture, which above all others had been both the foundation and the central pillar. Let me, let me just say something, brothers and sisters. You take a tent, and it have, have pillars all around the edges of it, and you have one central pillar right in the very center of it. Now, you can pull out a pillar around the edge, and the tent will still stay up. It might look a little lopsided, but it will still stay up. But you take the central pillar out, and the tent is coming down. So Satan has and is attacking the central pillar of the Advent faith, the sanctuary, brothers and sisters. And it's just not, it's just not the sanctuary, but it's the cleansing of the sanctuary. Because, see, brothers and sisters, the cleansing of the sanctuary represents victory over sin. You see, we can talk about the sanctuary all we want. All the, the different things and that's there, the bread, the, the cow stick and all that. But brothers and sisters, that is no good unless we understand that the sanctuary is teaching on the day of atonement in the most holy place experience that we can have victory over sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. And that's what Satan is fighting against. Look what she says again. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Let's go to our Bible. Let's go to our Bible. Let's go to Daniel, the eighth chapter. Daniel 8. As we're getting ready to bring this, this, this first DVD in our second series to a close. Let's go to Daniel 8 now. In Daniel 8, the Bible says, verse 9, the Bible says, we want to read it first, and out, we want to read it from the Bible first. The little horn, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And things we just read some very very important information. Let's go to our screen to try to analyze. Daniel 8 9, and out of one of them came forth a love horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Now notice what's taking place here. The love horn comes out. He waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. That's all horizontal. That's Pagan Rome, because the little horn comes up first as pagan Rome in Daniel 8. Now, in Daniel 7, it comes up as, 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 as paper Rome first. But in Daniel 8, God merges them. So in Daniel 8, it starts out as pagan Rome. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. Now, I know we had gone into the details of this. Verse 10, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven. That's vertical. So, Pagan Rome gave its seat in great authority to paper Rome, and paper Rome went vertical. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now watch it, saints. Watch it. There's our Pope. Your Pope. Look what it says now. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice, sacrifice being the supplied word, was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now what the Bible is saying here is that when the papacy came on the scene, that the papacy actually, uh, actually cast down the sanctuary to the ground. That's what it's saying. Look what it says. Let me read it. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, we know that the papacy could not actually go to heaven and cast down the sanctuary to the ground. So let's look at the next verse to see what this is really saying, because this is going to give us a key. 
And an host was giving him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Now, let's analyze what we just read. First of all, the, 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 the text says the sanctuary was cast down. But in the next verse, it says the truth was cast down. What does that tell you? That tells you that the truth is in the sanctuary. So the truth, when you came into the church and you said you were in the truth, it, it meant more than just the Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, it's the sanctuary. And it's not the sanctuary. It's victory over sin. You see, saints, Jesus did not come that we would continue in sin, but he came to, 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 to empower us to have victory over sin. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, too. A whole lot more. So the sanctuary was cast down. Yea, the truth was cast to the ground. So, brothers and sisters, the casting of the sanctuary to the ground is simply the casting of the truth to the ground. The truth is in the sanctuary. And you know, saints, when we came on the scene as a people, that was the one thing that God gave us that we reestablished. We recognized that that was a heavenly sanctuary. And brothers and sisters, the Bible says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That is the thing that establishes us as a people. And the host was giving him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. The little horn set up an earthly sanctuary, brothers and sisters, and it practiced and prospered. And so, saints, the truth is in the sanctuary. Let's continue. Let the truths that are the foundation of our faith be kept before the people. Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They talk science, and the enemy comes in and gives them an abundance of science. But it is not the science of salvation. It is not the science of humility, of consecration, or of the sanctification of the spirit. We are now to understand what the pillars of our faith are. Brothers and sisters, we need to know what the pillars of our faith are. The truths that have made us as a people what we are, leading us on step by step. We are to understand. Let me, let me reemphasize this as we are bringing this, this, this first DVD and this second series to a close. We need to understand what the pillars of our foundation are, what they are, because the Omega is an attack upon them. Let's look at this statement. Again, she says, the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Now, saints, she goes on to tell us what would happen if this reformation took place. Now, brothers and sisters, it's, going, it's amazing that the prophet said what would happen if this took place. And we're going to see that the very things that she said would take place are actually taking place. Now we want to see what would happen. She says if this would happen, this, were this reformation to take place, what would result? Let's, let's go back, let's go back. The enemy of souls have sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven day events. A reformation was supposed to take place. And that this reformation would consist in one, giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. This is the Omega. Our religion would be changed. Saints, I want to make sure that you, you, you get this. If this is found right there in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 204, 204 to 206, I believe. I want to make sure you get this because we're coming back to this in, 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 our, in our next DVD. Our religion would be changed. This, she says if this Omega took place, this is what would happen. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy 
would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. But God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power. Brothers and sisters, if you have watched the first series, Decision Time, and you looked at Daniel, the, I mean, the, the information on Revelation 11 chapters, two discs, two discs uh, part one and part two on Revelation 11 chapter, then you have some idea of this dependence on human power because you know came, what came out of the French Revolution was this, this reasoning, human reasoning, and it's everywhere today. We found out that this, it went to the East as communism, but it came to the West as suckling humanism. Look what it's saying. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure, brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not going to comment on this because I'm going to comment on it in the next disc. But I want you to see what would constitute the omega of apostasy. And brothers and sisters, all that God told this woman, all that he showed her, brothers and sisters, you and I are living in. And let me tell you something. This fifth generation of Seventh-day Adventists that are being born into this church right now, if they would grow up to become the pastors and deacons and elders and, 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 and conference presidents, what have you, none of the truths that God gave this church in the first generation would be around. It would all be extinct. J.L. Mahaney in 1937 made the comment, if the pioneers in his day, if the pioneers in his day, he said, if the pioneers would awaken in his day, they would not even recognize the church in 1937. What about today in 2009? Now, I don't say this evil, uh, untactful, but I'm simply telling you, brothers and sisters, that it's decision time. You and I must earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And I want to know, let you know, saints, as we move into the next disc. We must have victory over sin. And we're going to talk about that time element here. We must obey God rather than man. Victory over sin. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we come before the righteous and holy throne, we pray that the Holy Spirit will attend this information that we have shared with our people that we must have victory over sin and that Satan has done all he can to attack this church, to eradicate these precious truths that you've given us. The Alpha of Apostles has come and the Omega is here. The same attack upon the foundation principles of this precious message that was attempted by Satan through the Alpha is now manifesting itself even bigger, even more vicious in the Omega. Ellen G. White said it would be of a most strong nature and she trembled for our people. Lord, help us to get ready, to get ready, to get ready before it's everlasting too late. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing this prayer. Thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name.